Don't hit recording yet. Ah. Okay, Chavra. This Shabbos is a very, very special one indeed, as we're going to read the special portion of Vayeshev. And uh, it is also Shabbos Hanukkah. As Hanukkah begins Thursday night, Friday is the first day Hanukkah, Shabbos is the second day Hanukkah. Vayeshev uh, begins a, a new period in the history of Yaakov and his family. In fact, basically the next four portions, Vayeshev, Miketz, Vayigash, and Vayechi, will discuss the children of Yaakov and all that happens to them and leads them down to Egypt. So the Torah starts with the words Vayeshev Yaakov and Yaakov dwelt Be'eretz Megurei Oviv in the land of his, uh, that his father inhabited. Now, Vayeshev is an unusual term to use that, that he lived there. Uh, so Rashi says, Bikesh Yaakov Leshev Beshalva. Yaakov had something everybody will agree, a, mo a life full of turmoil and challenges. It begins in the womb with uh, holding on to Esau and fighting to get out. And then he has the whole problems with his brother Esau and the blessings. He gets out of there and then he has the problems with Lavan and working for his wives and the fights with Lavan's children and all those times that he was cheated with the sheep. And finally he leaves Lavan he makes peace somehow with Esau, and then he has the story of Dina. So if anybody deserved a life of peace, this was Yaakov. So Rashi says, Bikesh Yaakov Leishev Bishalva, that the word Vayeshev means basically settling and living in peace. And he wanted to have peace. And Rashi says that the Almighty says, it is enough that you'll have peace in the next world. So kofats all of rugzoi shall you save. The whole turmoil, the, the uh, anger, if you want to call it, of Yosef that the brothers had towards him jumped up. So the Rebbe points out on this word, that Rugzoi shall Yosef, that um, what is so terrible that he wanted peace, that that led to the anger of Yosef. So Rashi points out that the truth is the time had not yet come for peace. Why? Because there was a promise at the Brisbane Absarm of the covenant of halves that Abraham's children will be strangers. In addition, we learned in last week's portion that Yaakov stayed away from Yitzchak for 22 years without any contact. And so too, the consequence would be that Yosef, who at this time the Torah tells us is 17, plus 22, that means he'll be 39 before him and Yaakov have contact again. That's 22 years. And so that was a consequence. That wasn't what stopped Yaakov from having peace. It was Rugzai Shal Yosef. It was the, the whole turmoil of the brothers, the fact that they couldn't have, uh, that they couldn't see each other till then had to be, but it didn't have to be 
with such an anger, so to say, such a pain involved. The Rebbe also points out that the word Vayeshev uh, seems to be, in a way, the wrong word for the, ver for the name of the verse. What does Vayeshev mean? That he settled. And yet the whole portion talks about the unsettling in such a great way. So the Rebbe says that actually Yaakov's prayer was fulfilled. He asked for a settlement and for peace, and he got it. As we learn in Vayechi, the 17 best years of Yaakov's life were in Egypt. He lived a very uh, great, a peaceful life. And God wanted to give him a greater peace and tranquility than he really, in a way, deserved. So this ordeal with Yosef, in order to challenge Yaakov and to lift him up spiritually, led to Vayeshev, to him having a settled life much, much later. So anyway, the Torah goes in to tell us that um, Yaakov is living in the land of Canaan. He thinks his problems are over. Yosef at this time is 17 years old. As I told you, 22 years will pass before he says Yaakov. Because we know that when he became viceroy to Egypt, the Torah tells us he was 30. Then there is the seven years of plenty and the two years of famine, which may, brings him up to 39, and that's 22 years from this story. The Talmud criticizes, in a way, Yaakov's behavior because <laughs> Yaakov sh openly showed favoritism towards Yosef. This is a question that many people, children, often have. I remember personally, whenever we would ask my mother, who is your favorite? She would always answer, all my children are our favorite. So parents like to say that, but for whatever reason, it, always, it isn't always true. Whether it is or it isn't true, sometimes a parent can't help it. But what he can do is discipline his actions and not show it in any way. Yaakov, for whatever reasons, and there are many Kabbalistic reasons beyond the scope of this year, this is just an overview of the Pasha, favored Yosef. The problem is he showed it to his brothers, to all the brothers as well. The Torah says that the reason he favored Yosef, he was Rachel's son born to an old age, and he showed his favor by giving him a very special ksenas pasim, a special robe. And as a result of this favoritism, the brothers, it says, Vayisnu'u'isoi, they basically hated him and uh, they didn't speak to him with peace. And then we read that Yosef has two dreams. <coughs> One is that there are sheaves in the middle of the field and his sheaf is standing upright and the other sheaves referring to the brothers bow down to him and they get upset with him and say, well, who do you think you are that you're trying to, to rule over us? And then he has another dream that the sun, the star of the moon and 11 stars are bowing down to him. And once again, he tells it to his brothers. It seems in a way a bit strange that he should tell his brothers such a story just to make them angrier. 
But according to some commentaries, he was trying to show them that it's not him. It comes from above. The Rebbe also points out that these two dreams were the two extremes. The sheaves on earth were the physical and the stars and the um, sun and the moon were more spiritual. Now, Yaakov says to him, What is this dream that you dreamt? Why do you have to add the word Asher Cholomto that you dreamt? You could have just said, what is this dream all about? So they tell a uh, famous story that uh, a, there was once a Rebbe um, who, who, had a, who had a son and the uh, Rebbe Nebuch uh, passed away. And the Hasidim did not feel that this son was an appropriate one to be the next Rebbe. So he didn't, they didn't appoint him. He wanted to be appointed. So he came to the Hasidim and he said, my father came to me in a dream and said, you must appoint me. So those Hasidim went to another famous Rebbe to ask his advice. And basically that Rebbe said, Tell that son that he should tell his father the next time he comes in a dream that if he wants the Hasidim to appoint his son as Rebbe, then that passed away Rebbe should come to the Hasidim in the dream. Then it has some value. As long as he only comes to his son in the dream, the Hasidim are not obligated to listen. And so he says, that's what Yaakov was saying. The fact that you dreamt it, Asher Chalam To, doesn't necessarily give it any value. And we, this opens up, the story opens up with these dreams to lead to the next chapter. And that is that the brothers go to um, pasture the father's flocks Bishchem, in Shechem. Now Rashi points out Shechem was a place which would really be a, a, a very damaging place to the Jewish people. We know that Dina was raped in Shechem. The, this whole thing happens in Shechem and many others in the future. I would just like to point out that Shechem is the city that Yaakov gave additionally to Yosef, and Shechem is the city where Joseph is buried, obviously, till today. Sadly enough, uh, when the Knesset decided to do the suicidal pact of giving away land for so-called peace, they also gave away the city of Shechem. And there are a lot of problems with the visiting Yosef's grave till today and all that, but that's for a different time as well. So Yaakov sends Yosef to see how his brothers are doing. And he says, go to Shechem. Now, Yosef knew that his brothers didn't like him, but nevertheless, he had such a great honor for his father that if his father sent him, he was ready to disregard any peril and any danger it goes. Now, look at chapter 37, verse 15. And uh, it says that Yosef came to Shechem and he couldn't find his brothers. A man found him. Behold, Yosef is wandering in the field. And the man said, What are you looking for? And uh, Yosef answers, he's looking for his brother. The man tells him, go to Doison, and he finds them there. 
And according to Rashi, that man was Gavriel. The Rebbe points out that um, we find a similar expression um, in last week's portion, where Yaakov is alone and he meets a man. And there Rashi says that this was referring to the angel of Esau. Here Rashi says, that this was Malach Gavriel. Now, the Rebbe asks, how does Rashi know that that was the angel of Esau and here it was Gavriel? And his answer is basically that what was the uh, person in Yaakov's story trying to do? He was trying to prevent him and stop him. He even fought with him and displaced the sciatic nerve. Well, while here, the person who met him was helping him, was giving him advice. So you see by the actions of who it is. A person that comes to, to, to be negative is a negative force. A force of ace of a person who comes to be positive is the good force. But what is this all about? He is wandering in the field and a person says, what are you looking for? One rabbi just stops on that verse alone, verse 15. And he says, soya basoda. whenever a person finds himself wandering, he's in a quandary. He has no idea what direction to take. And we all find ourselves in those situations from time to time. We're in our life, especially perhaps more in COVID, where we don't have the normal directions we do. And we are wandering in the field. We don't know what to do. He says, stop, reflect, and ask yourself, Matavakish, what are you looking for? Ask yourself, what is the end goal? What did Hashem put you here for? What are the circumstances you're in? Matavakish, what are you looking for? What do you think God Almighty is looking for? And by reflecting on that, you will know which direction to go towards. Now, Yosef is heading towards the brothers. The Torah tells us they see him from a distance. And they say, look, this guy who is trying to become superior of us is coming towards us. Let's put him to death and uh, we'll throw his body into one of the pits. We'll say that a wild animal hit him and we will be rid of him. Uh, Rashi, the Rebbe, and many commentaries explain that there are many reasons that they felt Yosef was worthy of the death sentence. And therefore, as a Besden, they felt they had to carry it out. But the first one who comes to Yosef's defense and savior is Ruvain. He does not do a complete job, by the way. It will be Yehuda who will save him completely to a degree. But the Torah testifies that uh, Yoy Aruvain wanted to save Yosef and bring him back to his father. The Gemara says that had Ruvain known what the Torah was, says about him, that his good intentions, he wanted to save him, then he would have lifted Yosef up on his shoulders and bring him back to his father in great publicity. Bottom line is he didn't. He was the one who said, let him go into a pit. And Rashi points out that what Ruvain said is, you feel that we are a Bethden and we have ruled that Joseph is worthy of the death sentence. Maybe we are being biased. And maybe it is not up to us to rule that and to actually kill him. 
Let's rather throw him into a pit. And that pit, it says, is Ein Boy Mayim. There was no water. Rather, there were snakes, scorpions, and poisonous things. And if God said that he deserves the death sentence, then those poisonous things will kill him. But we shouldn't be the ones to, uh, to kill him. And so when he comes, they pull off his coat and they throw him into the pit. And they are able to actually go to a meal, which means that in their minds, their consciousness was totally clear. They felt that they had done the right thing. Now, the Ishmaelim are coming and the Torah says that they were uh, basically like peddlers schlepping from place to place, buying and selling things. And the Torah specifies that the camels were carrying spices and then and beautiful, good, good things. And Rashi says, normally they dealt with kerosene and tar, but because it's Yosef was going to be taken to Egypt, there was quite a bit before he was taken to Egypt, quite a few uh, directions and selling and selling. Um, therefore, they carried things that will be pleasant for him on the journey. And Yehuda says, what will we gain if we kill our brothers? Um, so they explain two things about the word betza. Betza is the three Hebrew letters can either be uh, the base is boiker, the tzaddik is sohorayim, and the ayin is Erev, morning, afternoon, and evening. Those are the three times that we daven shachus mincha maidav. And Yehuda said, how can we in good consciousness daven our shachus mincha maidav if we have blood on our hands and we killed our brothers? Another explanation they give is that Betza is the second letter of each of the patriarch's names. The base is Avraham, the tzaddik is Yitzchak, and the ayin is Yaakov. And that is that we should be um, worthy children of these uh, uh, three uh, forefathers and not kill our brother. And the Torah says that they sold Joseph for 20 pieces of silver. That will be a great, great harm done, as everybody knows, from Yom Kippur, Davening, where we have the Eila Eskera. We speak about the Ten Martyrs. And the opening to the Ten Martyrs is that this terrible anti-Semitic Roman Caesar goes to the great tzaddikim of his generation and asks them, says to them, in the Torah it says that if you kidnap someone and you sell them, you get the death sentence. Well, I read here that the brothers, the 10 brothers kidnapped Joseph. They sold him for 20 pieces of silver and nothing happened to them. So you are the ones who will get the death sentence instead of the 10 brothers. And they asked Rabbi Shmuel Kern Godel to go on Elias and Shaman to find out if in heaven it was decreed. And the answer was that it was decreed. And the 10 martyrs, including Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Yeshevav, as you see, um, all the, the 10 martyrs mentioned in the Yom Kippur, service were tortured to death. And according to the Zohar, those 10 martyrs were actually a reincarnation of these 10 brothers. Ruvain, as Rashi points out, was not there at the time. So he wasn't aware exactly of what was happening. And they took this cloak 
of Joseph because Joseph's not there anymore. And they put it into goat's blood and they bring it to Yaakov and they say, recognize it, who it is. And he says, this is the cloak of my son. And he mourns the, his son till he'll be found. It'll be 22 years that he will be mourning Yosef. And again, there's a whole discussion as to why Yaakov had to go uh, through this. Now, Rashi also points out that Yitzchak was still alive at the time. He knew prophetically that Yosef was not dead, but he said that there must be a reason why God doesn't inform Yaakov that Yosef's not dead. So if God doesn't inform him, what can we do? The Ishmaelim sell him to the Medjonim and the Medonim sell him to Egypt. Now, according to uh, also Kabbalists, they say that when the 10 brothers sold Joseph, they basically made him their slave. And this is a very deep halachic aspect because by making Joseph their slave, eventually Joseph will be the viceroy of Egypt. And so he will represent and be the leader of Egypt. So although the Egyptians will enslave the Jews, the fact is that they will, so to say, be the um, enslaves of the 10 brothers and their descendants. And we then read that um, the brothers turn to Judah and they say, you are really the one who got us into this whole mess because you we looked up to as a leader. Had you told us to bring Joseph back to, to Jacob, we would have done it. You are the one who advised us to sell him. And look at Jacob. Look at our father. He is mourning and we can't comfort him. He, he's a smench. We have destroyed him. And so Judah, it says, was, was totally down. His brothers didn't want to have anything to do with him. And so the Torah tells us that Judah traveled to another place, Adu, uh, to a place called Adulomi. And there he meets with a man by the name of Chira. So the commentaries point out that what is happening here? Yaakov is busy mourning what he thinks is the passing of his sons. The sons are totally down because it took all these actions to them to wake up to what they actually did, the consequences of their actions. Sometimes people get so involved with what they're doing that they don't fully comprehend or appreciate the implications of what they're doing. It takes time to dawn on you. And they realized, Vasot Mingiton, what did we do? So, but sometimes you can regret your actions when Heint Bismarck and once they're done, it's impossible to change it. And um, so they were in mourning. Yehuda was in mourning. Joseph himself was in mourning. Everything looked bleak. Everything looked like night. But it says in the Kabbalistic writings that in heaven, Hashem had brought all this together in order to, for the light at the end of the tunnel to break the opening towards Mashiach when the light of the world will come. Because as we'll see in this very strange story of Yehuda, 
this is the beginning of the the uh, breakthrough of the uh, of Mashiach's coming. So the Torah tells us that Yehuda is um, in 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 Adul, by Adulami. He sees a man, a daughter of a man by the name of Shua, and he has a son heir. Now it's interesting to note. Air is the letters Ayin Reish. And if you look at verse 7, it says that Air is Ra Be'enei Hashem in the eyes of God, and God kills him. It's interesting that the word Air and the word Ra are the same letters, just the opposite, Ayin Reish and Reish Ayin. Then he has another son by the name of Onain, and then he has a third son by the name of Shelah. And Judah sees a, a woman by the name of Tamar, whom he marries to Er. You'll see later that er, er, Tamar is a daughter, a descendant of Shame. And <clears throat> Tamar, however, is a very, very beautiful woman. And uh, what Rashi says is that Er felt that the childbirth will mar Tamar's beauty. And so he doesn't ever impregnate her. How do we know that? Because in the next verse, after Er is passes away, is killed by Hashem, Yehuda tells Einon, the next son, to marry um, Tamar, and he should be the Yibum, that is a leveret marriage, and that is the law of a Yavam is that if a man marries a woman, and he dies without children. It is the responsibility of the next brother to marry that woman. And the first child is called after the father. Kabbalistically, it means that it's the first. The son is, is like taking over the soul of the deceased brother and building it up. And it says that Einon knew that his first son will not be called after him. Whenever he would have relations with his brother's wife, he would make the semen go into the ground. Basically, he wouldn't uh, make her pregnant. That, by the way, is the word onanism. And from the book of uh, Bereshis, we have two words, both relating to very unpleasant circumstances, which went into the English dictionary. One is sodomizing from the story of Lot and Sodom, and the other is onanism from this story, and onan is uh, killed as well. Now, Yehuda turns to Tamar, and you know, there's a law, actually, that if a um, few husbands die under a woman, it's not a great idea to, work, to marry that woman, not because she's doing anything wrong, but maybe because it's, so to say, a bad muzzle to end up with her. So Yehuda says, I have three sons, Er and Einan are gone. He tells Tamar, go back to your father's house. And when Shelah grows up, then I will uh, consider her giving him to you as a wife. Now, Yehuda's wife passes away. And Yehuda goes to graze his sheep. Now, in those days, it seems, uh, in the Torah law, a leveret marriage is that if a person passes away without children, 
then the brother should marry. But in those days, they tell us that that actually applied to the closest relative indeed. So Yehuda halachically would be allowed to marry Tamar to, to, to be the leveret marriage. But it's a very, very strange story. And that is Tamar sees she is not going to be given to Shela. She sees by Ruach HaKodesh that she has to be give birth to uh, children from Yehuda, which will be the forebears of Moshiach. So she dresses like a prostitute whom Yehuda cannot see who it is. And when Yehuda passes her, he has an extraordinary um, push, impetus to be with this woman, an impetus that he can't even explain. It came from above. So he turns to her and he says, um, what is your price? I will send you a goat. And she says, fine, but give me some type of security. And she tells him, if you give me your signet ring, which is a very personal thing, no one else had it because that was like your power of attorney, your signature on your checks, and you give me your stick, then you can be with me. And she falls pregnant. Now, Tamar, by law, was still not free to marry with anybody else because she was still in that status of leveret marriage. It says Yehuda sent that goat through his good friend, but they couldn't find that woman whom he was with. And um, then, after three months, it is told to Yehuda that Tamar is visibly pregnant. And Yehuda says that her punishment being that uh, shame was Melech Sholem, the Kohen of the time, that she should be thrown into the fire. Although she had that consequence of throwing into the fire, the Gemara says, she didn't embarrass Yehuda publicly. All she did was send the signet ring and the staff and say, this is the man to whom I am pregnant. Yehuda would have the choice to either own up or not own up. If he doesn't own up, then she will be basically executed. And she was ready to take that upon herself not to be and not to humiliate Yehuda in public. And from here, the Gemara says, we should learn how terrible embarrassing someone is because it is better to be thrown into a furnace of fire than humiliate someone. Unfortunately, not everyone takes that advice so seriously. We take great pleasure in embarrassing and humiliating people. Uh, well, some people do, especially when it gives them a, a certain uh, benefit. Okay, it's, uh, you know, even when you have a, a, a one line or a comeback line, you think to make yourself more popular, you, get, you put it out there, no matter what the humiliation to another person is, Tamar won't do that. And Yehuda here has the inner strength to be able to admit that he's wrong. And he says, yes, they are mine. And uh, she is right. And, and uh, she is saved. And then there are twins. And we read a very interesting thing. One of the babies sticks out his hand 
and they put a scarlet thread around the hand to say that he came first and he put back the hand and the brother came out and he is called Peretz and then the other one whose um, <laughs> hand had that red thread comes out and he is called Zorach. It seems like there's a certain similarities with the story of Yaakov and Esau. But um, it is from Peretz breaking through that um, the children of Yehuda, the descendants of Yehuda, will be Dovra Melech, will come from Sarach, uh, from Peretz, I mean. And mm -hmm. that obviously is the father of Mashiach. So here you have that situation where everything looked dark and bleak, and yet the Almighty is sowing the seed and creating the light of Mashiach. And hopefully that will be the same situation now. We are getting quite bleak and dark predictions about the virus and about all this situation that we are in. And um, the Almighty is bringing the light of Mashiach. Having finished about Yehuda, the Torah goes back to focus on Joseph. Now, Joseph is brought down to Egypt and he is sold to Potiphar, who is the chief of the uh, butchers of, of Paroi. It seems like these chiefs we have here, the chief of the butchers, Later in the dream, you'll have the steward over the wine and the steward over the, the baking goods. These are not the professions I don't think that we think of today. Rather, these were very important ministers. Today, you might call them the minister of defense, the minister of, uh, the minister of interior, whatever you call them. But these are very important, uh, prominent ministers in Paris courtyard. And Potiphar is the one who buys Yosef. Yosef, it says, became a extremely successful person. Now, it says that even though he was successful, he lived in the house of his master, the Egyptian. What is that telling us? Perhaps that is explaining why Yosef does not let his father Yaakov know. This is one of the big questions. If Yosef reached such prominence, why didn't he send a message? He knew how much his father was mourning him. Well, at this time in his life, he couldn't send a message because he was a slave. Even though he was a slave, the master could see that he had extreme success and blessing. Perhaps just like Lovan saw it was Yaakov who brought blessing to him in the same way Paitifa saw that it was Yosef who brought blessings to him. And he was very, very um, successful as a result. And to the degree that Paitifa trusted Yosef implicitly, and he appointed him over everything except Kim HaLechem Asher besides the bread that he ate, and that, Rashi says, is his wife. And he is in Potiphar's house for 10 years, being extremely successful, and then the Torah says, Why he Yosef Yefei Toyer Vifei Mara. He was well built on a fine appearance. You don't find this expression generally said about a man. But as we discussed in, in last week's portion, that uh, when Leah had a seventh pregnancy, she prayed that that pregnancy be turned from a boy to a girl. 
and that was Dina. So according to the Kabbalists, Yosef, so to say, had the, a female neshama. Dina had more a male neshama. And that's why Dina was Vayatzonis. She went out to see the, the members of Shechem. And about Yosef, it says that he was a very uh, a very beautiful looking guy, which is normally said about a woman, not only that, but Rashi says that he used to comb his hair and um, really look after his looks. And that leads to big problems that will happen with we, uh, we can't really understand what's going on here. But Potiphar is the most powerful person, a minister in Paris court. And the, a very powerful woman, his wife, who must have been a very beautiful woman. Here she looks at this slave and decides she wants him. And uh, right after Shishi, we have a Shalshelis. There are not many of them in the Torah, but where Yosef refuses her, it says, Yosef refuses her and says, this is not right. It's not right in Jewish law. It's not right in Egyptian law. And I will be sinning to God. There's no way I can do it. And yet she works on his ego. Can you imagine? Here's a man who has been abhorred basically by his brothers, sold as a slave. He was in a position of prominence and power by his family. And yet the brother slow, sold him. Nothing can make him feel lower ego-wise. And this woman looks up to him. And um, it says there was a public holiday. Everyone was out of the house except for that woman. And Joseph came home to do the work. And Rashi here says a very strange thing. That in the back of his mind, Joseph almost agreed to sin with the wife of Paitifa. Why didn't he? The Gemara says two reasons. One is that he saw the face of Yaakov at that moment, who was so proud of him. And he saw that if he, God forbid, sins with this woman, he will lose the pride and he couldn't do that, not himself or his father. Another thing it says is that he saw a vision of the breastplate that the Kohen Gadol wore on he, on he, he, there, the, the Urim Vetumim, the Cheshen, that the uh, breast, uh, that the Kohen Gadol wore when he went into the Kodesh HaKadoshim well, into the uh, base of Mikdash, not the Kaddish Kaddashim, but into the base of Mikdash. And one of the names was Yosef. And he saw that if he'd sin, that name would disappear. In other words, just before he fell into temptation, he saw the consequences and implications of doing that wrong thing. And that prevented them from doing Alavai, all the presidents of the United States and others would see the great embarrassment and implications if they're caught red-handed and that would be able to prevent them from doing foolish deeds. But one of the questions asked is, why does Rashi tell us that Joseph almost sinned? And perhaps one reason is the Torah is from Meloshan Hayra. It's a lesson for us. And if we would think that Joseph was such a powerful man, that even though his ego was broken, he was never even tempted, then we'd say, what do we have with him in common? We are tempted. We're regular human beings. So we can't learn from his actions by teaching us 
that Joseph, even though he was of such great stature, nevertheless, he had a challenge. He had an inner fight to overcome his temptation means that we can also always learn the same and overcome the temptation. She accuses him of rape and Joseph is flung into the jail. And even in the jail, he is also um, comes to great prominence and people could see that Hashem is with them. Here is a man, no matter what position he is in, and he's called Yosef Atzadik for all the positions that he was in and what the prominence he, he, he built up to, but he is always seen by everybody as a person whom God smiling upon and brings success. At that time, the two great ministers of Egypt, which is the um, Sada Mashkim, the uh, cupbearer, and the Sada Oifim, the baker. As I say, these are not uh, wine stewards or bakers. They are important ministers in the palace, and they do something to offend. One, the fly flew into Paris' cup. The other is they found a stone in his bread. Rashi says that this was God's way. You see, even though, even in those days, press had a way of influencing the people. So Joseph's story was in all the press. Everyone was saying, look at this, look what he did. And he came and Patifa made him so powerful. And his wife, the Ganze Geschichte. So to get Joseph off the headlines, these became the new headlines and they were both imprisoned. And um, they have a dream. Now, in um, verse 6 of uh, chapter 40, Joseph comes to the morning, in the morning, and they are in melancholy. And he says, Why are your faces so downcast today? which at first glance sounds a little ironic as a statement. Two ministers, most powerful people in Egypt, are thrown into jail. They're there in jail, they have a dream, and Joseph says, why do you look so melancholy? Why do you look so depressed today? What do you mean, why do you look so depressed? We were powerful ministers, and now we're in a dungeon, we're in a jail. But anyway... It shows you that even in circumstances, you should try and see the bright side and not fall into a yeosh, into total depression and giving up. They tell him their dreams. The one dream is that the um, vine had three branches and Pari is going to, to the, his cup is in his hand, in the wine steward's hand. And he takes the grapes, squeezes them, and puts them in the cup of paroi. And Yosef says, that means in three days, there's going to be paroi's birthday party. He's going to over, he's going to look at everything a second time. And you, he's going to decide, you go back to your position, you're going to be a minister again. The baker sees that that was a good interpretation. And he says, there's three baskets on my head and the birds are eating from the basket. And Yosef says, in three days, you are going to be hung and the birds will be eating your head, basically. What is the difference between the two, say the commentaries? In the first one, he was squeezing. There was an action. In the second one, something was being done to him. We always have to act. And Joseph asked the Saramashkim to remember him to the Parai and to say that I am not guilty. As Joseph foretold in those days, the party was, and exactly as Joseph predicted happened, the wine steward became the minister again, the baker was hung, 
And then the Torah says, V'loi zochar saramash k'mesh Yosef, and the wine steward did not remember Joseph, Ayishkocheyu, he forgot him. Obviously forgot him. Why this double expression? And um, some commentaries say that it's actually talking about two people. The first one is that the Saramashkim did not remember Joseph. The other is Joseph regretted having asked the man to help him. It was Joseph who forgot about that incident and didn't put his trust in him. And it would be two years because of this before Joseph would be saved. This Shabbos, as I said, is Pasha's, um, is Shabbos Hanukkah. So we also read a special Haftada of the uh, book of Zechariah, and it is the Rani Vesimchi Basirin. It is the Hanukkah Haftada. It's all a description of the menorah, and it also has a famous verse, Loi Bechayel, the Loi Bekoyach, Kim Beruchi, that in life, it is not power and not strength. It is God's spirit. That's what we saw on Hanukkah. I wish everyone a good Shabbos, a good Hanukkah, a good holiday, and we'll see what will be in the future. God bless you. Thank you, Erwin, Yitzchak, Zaev, Mandy, Roy, and all those. Yes. Who- yes.